Welcome to the Penny Stock and Cryptocurrency Survival Guide. Before we get into the class itself, I wanna give you a little bit of context. The class I put together several years ago, but the key thing here is that the class is about emotions and psychology. And with emotions and psychology, because we're human beings, they've always been around and they will always be around. So what you learn about has been valuable, still is valuable, and will be valuable in the future because we're humans. We're always gonna have anger, greed, overconfidence, sorrow, freaking out, all those things have always been around and will always be around and the key is when you understand those dynamics as cruel and mean as it sounds you can leverage those dynamics against other people if you understand how other people are feeling how other people are viewing different circumstances then like i said you can leverage that to put profit in your pocket yes that sounds mean but that's how the financial markets work. It's understanding how other people are feeling and believing and then using that to your advantage. The other note is that this course is based around penny stocks, but please realize this for you crypto traders. Anytime I say the word penny stock, do you realize that you can and should replace that with a cryptocurrency? Anytime I'm talking about an exact penny stock, please realize you can and should insert in any sort of coin that you may be looking at because the emotions and psychology is a perfect parallel between penny stocks and cryptocurrency markets. And it's, you know, it's a way that you need to go into surviving penny stock trading, crypto trading, or maybe you're gonna do both, but you better understand how what I call the wilderness works because if you can understand the wilderness, you're gonna give yourself a way better opportunity to make money as a whole. So let's go to my desktop and let's get into the class. Now we're gonna take a look at just some core concepts. These are just the, the, the fundamentals of uh, you know penny stock survival. You know, it, you gotta be able to build a fire if you wanna be able to survive. And these are the things that, you know, within the overall context, now that we are all masters of how that wilderness operates, just how everything flows and jives. You know, these are just some of the core concepts that you'll see a lot of times pop up. You know, some of them, we're gonna address misconceptions here. Other things, just gonna try to build some perspective. So all these things are built around giving you the core foundational principles to, to keep you in that right frame of mind. And more importantly, just to give you, you know, the, the, proper, the proper perspective. So we're gonna go through all these different things. Uh, you know, These are gonna be the tools uh, that you're gonna need out in the penny stock wilderness. First, just gonna give, get some sort of financial perspective. You know, What does selling really mean? We're gonna talk about liquidity traps. Uh, you know, what order type is for me? There's um, you know, multiple different types of order, uh, orders out there. Um, shorty, why, shorting pen, why shorting penny stocks is bad policy. Uh, why we wanna embrace the shorts, you know, give them a hug. Uh, manipulation, what do we do? You know, if, if you've been around for even just a little bit, I'm sure you've seen that term thrown around, manipulation. Um, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news, maybe you've heard that, if not, definitely gonna go over that. And then we're gonna talk about the sailing ship that is doomed to sink. So first things first, the core, core, core concept of all of Pennyland is the financial perspective. Uh, you know, so many people show up and they're like, I'm not happy unless I make 300%. All right, let's get grounded in reality. And there's a there's a guaranteed way, um, you know, that I want to show this. So, in this example, and and this is where I am a prophet. Like I am, this is a for sure thing. I can guarantee, and I know a way that is guaranteed to make someone feel the way you see here. Just read the picture, look at it. I know how to make somebody feel like this, and this is how you do it. I want you to hit pause. And I want you to walk to your local bank and I want you to tell them that you want 10% return on investment ROI. And don't tell me you want a 10% ROI in, in a year. I don't want you to tell them that you want a 10% in a month. Not not in a week, but I, I want you to walk in and say, I want 10% in a couple of days. Can you deliver that for me on my money? And then I want you to film the reaction and, and please send it to me because it's gonna be hilarious. In the world of finance, a 10% return in a mere couple of days, that is crazy. It, it, it is just off the charts crazy and in a very good way. So why is it that most people in the penny stock wilderness are not happy unless they're making you know 50 to 100%, 200%, 3%? 3%. It really uh, boggles my mind, but at the same time it doesn't because it all boils back to emotion and psychology. It's pure greed, but it's also just a, a, a losing touch with reality. That's what it is because again, 10%, walk into your bank, I'll, that'll sum it up. I mean. 10% in a couple of days, your bank is gonna look at you and say, well, what sort of illegal activity are you expecting us to do? I mean, because that's just unheard of. Uh, you know, hedge fund managers would, you know, just, I mean, they, they would flip out, they would murder their, you know, best friend if they could accomplish 10%, you know, every couple of days. It's just, I mean, it's unheard of. So I want you to keep that in mind. We're just gonna go with the 10% 10, 10 number. Once again, got ahead of myself. The two reasons, greed, lack of perspective, 
Uh, you know, I want more. That's very commonplace out there. And these are the people I don't have much pity for them. You know, they are the hogs. And as the good old saying goes, you know, pigs get fat, hogs get slat, slaughtered. Um, and then lack of perspective, you know. Uh, but the good thing with lack of perspective is it can be corrected. If you're just a greedy hog, then, you know, that's there's only so much you can do but if you're just lacking a bit of perspective you know that's what this part of the presentation is all about and I want you to remember the core concept here is we want to be penny pigs we want to be the pigs of the penny stock wilderness not hogs because remember pigs get fat fat on profit the hogs are the ones that get slaughtered so core principle number one we are out our goal is to be little penny stock piggies and once again, just to keep things in perspective and, and kind of bring a little bit of, um, you know, just grounded reality here, uh, penny stock piggies, we can easily beat Wall Street. Uh, here's just the re, uh, you know some research I did. Again, whatever uh, year it is that you're watching this, uh, go to the search engines and put in that year and then top, or put in, you know, top performing mutual funds or top performing whatever and see what comes up. Uh, at this point in time, you can see that uh, this small growth, which covers the small cap companies for this mutual fund, 43% in one year. I don't. I might have just blocked that out. So you can see right there, performance one year, 43%. For a mutual fund, that is fantastic. But wait, let's just do some basic math. So if we're just going for 10% gains, all we have to do is make five of these trades over a 12 month period and our yield would be greater than what that is, 50%. And all we've done is made five trades over a course of 12 months at 10% each. And if you've ever been in you know, penny stocks, I will never call anything easy, uh, but 10%, um, if you're not greedy and if you're grounded in reality, uh, you know that's not very, um, it, 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 it's very doable. I'll put it like that. I'll never say anything in the stock market is easy, but it's very doable, very realistic if you're just aiming for, let's say 10%. Now also at the end of the day, everything is about personal preference. It's what do you feel comfortable with. So if you feel comfortable going for 15, 20, 30, 40%, then fine. I'm not gonna tell you what the percent is. I just picked 10 because uh, you know that that's what, it's just a nice round number, easy to do math with it. Maybe you're like, you know what, that, that's a good point. Uh, I'll, I'll go for 5%. You know, 5%, all I'd have to do in this example is make 10 trades over the course of 12 months. And, and then right again, I'm already beating the, you know, the best mutual funds out there. So what that number is, it's up to you, but you need to keep things in perspective. If you're one of those people that's only happy, if you got 100%, 150%, 200%, uh, you know, just reality check, you are a hog and you're gonna eventually get slaughtered. It, it may be going well for you right now, but uh, you know, the, the ax is grinding and waiting for you somewhere. Now I wanna talk about selling, and I, I, I feel like this is just a huge thing that many people overlook because I'm always getting this question, and uh, it's more of a phrase than anything, but probably more than I've heard of, of anything is, I'm not sure what to do. And then they go into uh, you know to, uh, 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 just uh, an email or uh, you know uh, whatever form of communication they're using, then they explain the situation. But it always starts off with, I'm not sure what to do, or it just ends with, you know, this is the situation, and then the final phrase is, I'm not sure what to do. Hey, welcome to the club. As a stock trader, you know, this is a feeling that we need to learn to live with, and I have no problem admitting I feel this way on a routine basis. I mean, I really wish that I could say that I'm a genie in a bottle and I always knew what the price was gonna do. I always knew what the belief was gonna be or you know, when the belief was gonna start to run out, when the Kool-Aid was gonna start to get diluted. I really wish I knew when all that stuff was gonna happen, but I don't. So what I tell them is, hey, just do what I do. Sell, but sell does not mean you have to sell every single one of your shares. That's a lot of people, especially new people, come to the market and then when they hear the word sell, they, um, that implies, you know, if I bought 100 shares, I have to sell 100 shares. Sell. No, the, you, your broker does not require you to sell every single share that you bought. You can break that up into multiple orders as much as you want. So, selling. You know, welcome to the club. If you don't know what to do, there's a way to go about this, though. And the way is, let's sell a portion of your shares. So, example, let's just use a nice round number. You own 1,000 shares and your shares are profitable, but now you're not sure if the price is you know, done going up. You're, uh, is, is the Kool-Aid starting to dilute it? I don't know. The belief, it seems like it might be running out, but I don't know, there might be another, uh, you know, there might be another talking point that the pumpers can use to keep on pushing the price up. Uh, I, I mean, there's some bashers here, but the bashers and pumpers, you know, they're throwing fists at one another. Um, so the Kool-Aid, you know, I think it's getting diluted, but then I don't. I could see where it might get totally diluted and then, you know, step 10 shows up and there's dead bodies. But I could also see where something big happens with Kool-Aid and then the Kool-Aid tidal wave comes again. If you feel like that and you're not real sure, 
just sell 500 of your shares. Now, why does this make sense? Well, let's you know break down the two options. You know, If indeed the price is near the high point and the Kool-Aid is about to get diluted, then hey, great, you just sold some of your shares at a great location right before things started to get nasty. But let's say you're wrong and let's say the Kool-Aid, a, title, a new tidal wave comes in and the uh, shares start to go higher again, hey, no problem, you still have 500 shares left and you've already locked in some profits. I mean, enjoy the continued ride and keep a smile on your face. Selling does not mean you have to completely remove yourself from the stock. You can take some of it out and then you can leave some of it in. That way, not only are you hedging against potentially maybe you know missing some of the run, but you're also locking in profits. And I've never met a trader that's gone broke locking in profits. So you know, don't take it as selling means everything. Take it as selling. I have the option to sell only in a certain allotment of my shares if I want. Again, all personal preference. I'm not saying you have to sell half like I did in this example. This is just an example. Do what you feel comfortable with. It's all about maintaining and keeping yourself within your personal risk tolerance level and within your comfort level in terms of what's going on. I mean, it is your money, so do whatever is going to allow you to sleep at night. The good old liquidity traps. Now, this is probably one of the biggest pitfalls in the entire wilderness and that they're gonna cause wounds and sometimes they're those major wounds that would can potentially knock you out or at least keep you out for a long time. So before I even get into you know what a liquidity trap is, let's just, you know, what is liquidity? Liquidity is the rate of speed at which an asset can be converted to cash. Remember, an asset is something that's good. In this case, your asset is a piece of paper that says this is a stock. Um, theoretically, you obviously don't get a piece of paper anymore, uh, but your asset here is stock and you wanna be able to convert that to cash. So let's just look at some things that are very liquid. You know, if someone writes you a check, and let's assume that it's a good check, you know, that they have the account funded, so that's the one assumption we're gonna make. If someone writes you a check, you can go to the bank and you're instantly given cash for it. That is a, a check from somebody that, you know, has the money in the bank account, that is a very liquid asset because you go to the bank and boom, the cash or the uh, bank tellers handing you, you know, cash right there on the spot. Very, very liquid. You convert it into cash right away. Not liquid is something like real estate. You know, a property on paper may say it's worth X amount, but until you find a seller and all the paperwork gets done, and you know, all you know, the inspections and all that stuff gets done, you have no cash. This process can take a few weeks, or it can never happen at all. I mean, if you bought a house for too much and you're trying to get a certain amount for it. There, there's no guarantee that that's, you're ever gonna be able to convert that asset back into cash because it's just, it's not a liquid investment. It's something where, um, you know, it just takes time. Um, and even if you are able to sell it, again, it's not like, unless you're like a drug dealer buying from somebody else and you're using a briefcase full of cash, but in the traditional sense of buying a house, even if you can sell it, you accept an offer on it, and then you know the closing company comes, the title insurance company do, uh, does, you know the real estate attorney, however it works in your state or wherever, they come and they do all their things, they do all the paperwork, usually at least 30 days, um, and then you can get the cash. So even in the best case of the same day you put it on the market and it sells on that same day, usually you're looking at at least 30 days before that asset is converted into cash. Whereas again, opposed to the very liquid, you get the check, and then you go in and boom, it's cash in hand. Not the same with real estate, that's why real estate is considered a non-liquid asset. Another asset that's very liquid, cash in your bank account. That's a very simple example. How is that liquid? Well, it's already cash. You walk to your bank, say, I would like, you know, I would like $10. Boom, it gives it to you, cash, very liquid very liquid. I mean, cash is the, I guess, the definition of liquidity. So cash on hand, there is no other thing that's more liquid than that. And the stock market liquidity is a huge factor. And lots of times it's often overlooked, especially in penny land, and it's extremely important. Um, now, how do you know how much liquidity there is in something? Now that we know what liquidity is, you know, the, the rate of speed at which you convert, can convert an asset into cash, now, how do we know how much liquidity is in the stock markets? Now, there's some software out there that'll automatically calculate this for you, but let's just assume it doesn't. Let's just go back to you know addition, subtraction, looking at the basics. The best way to look at it is look at the most recent volume and then multiply that number by the lowest price it traded for that day. Now, I say the lowest price it traded for that day, you may be thinking, well, that's not gonna give you an accurate number. Correct, it's not gonna give you an accurate number but at least you're playing it safe and not assuming that there's more liquidity than there actually is. And as you're gonna see, that's gonna be very important. So we wanna assume, we wanna play things on the safe side. So that's why I say use the lowest price 
that it traded for that particular day or time period, whatever you care about. So you go to a, a financial website and you pull up uh, the spiders, the uh, ticker symbol SPY. And what we're looking for over here is, first off, we need to find the amount of volume. So right here you can see on, on this particular day, it traded uh, 88.6 million shares. But that's, that's not the liquidity. We need to know how much dollar volume, which is cash is liquidity. So how much dollars actually went back and forth, how much conversion was going on. So it traded that many shares, and then the average share price for that day was between $187 and 188.36. So our calculation is the number of shares that were traded times multiplied, whatever you want to call it, the lowest price of the day's range, and that is 86 or 88.6 million times 187. And I didn't even put the number because it is just an obscene amount of liquidity. You know, SPY is one of the most liquid. Uh, you know things in the stock market. So that's one of these where you could buy $50,000 worth of stock and then you'd easily and very quickly be able to convert it back into cash if you wanted to. So the conversion rate, the rate of speed on something like SPY is basically, I don't know if you could hear that, but I just clicked my finger. It's basically that fast. As soon as you're hitting sell, or in other words, convert back to cash, your shares are being converted back into cash for you. So this is a very, very, very liquid uh, you know, area in the stock market. Now this is what trip up a lot of people and cause many people to just overlook, especially in the penny stock wilderness. They pull up something like this and they're like, holy smokes, this thing did in one day over 1,133%. That is insane. Man, if I were to put like you know, $10,000 here, that'd be worth so much now. Well, that is only half the battle and you know, this stuff, really doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because this thing was straight up a liquidity trap. So let's just do the math real quick. What was the day's range? It started at 0006, went up as high as 0061, and it did uh, 15.3 million shares. So let's do our equation. The one thing I am gonna change, uh, just uh, to prove the point here, is let's just assume that all these shares traded at the high of the day. Obviously that is not the case because at one point it was at triple zero six, but just for this example's sake, let's assume that every single one of these shares traded, traded at the high of the day. So we go through our calculation and the total dollar volume, which is what that is called, was less than $100,000. And that's, again, that's, a pl and that's assuming that everything was at the high of the day. So let's go back to our number. You could have bought $50,000 worth. Yes, that is true, however, it would be, or you would have a very, 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 very difficult time when trying to convert that back into cash because $50,000, but there's only that much, uh, you know, converting going on. I mean, you would be re you would be requiring over half the volume to go to you in order to be able to cash out if that was 50,000. Not to mention if you wanted, and that would just be breaking even. Let's say you wanted to make, you know, 10% uh, on that. Now you'd be needing 55,000. So it, it's one of those things where, yeah, that looks great, and oh, that's amazing. You know, I, I could have put five thousand dollars there, and no, because five thousand dollars, whatever that amount would have been, you wouldn't have been able to sell, sell out. There would have not have been enough sellers to take those shares from you. You would not have been able to convert back or convert your asset, which is your shares. And I use asset very lightly here when it's a penny stock, but you would have not been able to convert your shares back into cash. So what am I saying here? I am saying. Who cares about the percentage that it's up? That means nothing in the world of penny stocks. You need to know what sort of liquidity is. If you put money in, are you gonna be able to convert those shares back out into cash? That needs to be your primary concern. Uh, this probably should have been number one in the core concepts, but it, it flows a little bit better uh, in this order. But just know this, this is uh, a concept that uh, until you understand it, you are setting yourself up, um, you're setting yourself up in a very dangerous spot. Let's take a look at one more. Here's another penny stock. Uh, so you see, okay, uh, let's look at the range uh, from 59 cents up to 64. Okay, it did uh, 24.2 million. So let's run our calculation again. We're gonna assume on the safe side. So we will use 59 cents as uh, the share price. So the math, 24.2 times 59. This one did $14.3 million worth of volume. Okay, that, that's respectable. Now, is that something that you're gonna see, you know, on the big boards, uh, whether, you know, think of a huge company and then, you know, that stock is gonna be doing much, much more than this. However, for a penny stock company, 14.3 million, not bad. 
Uh, you could put fifty thousand work, uh, fifty thousand dollars into something like this, and when you're trying to convert it back uh, to cash, you you could do that. Now you wouldn't be able to do it instantaneously, like. Um, well, you could, but you'd probably crash the stock. But you, if you did it nice and slow over a couple of hours, you know this would be still a pretty nice conversion of uh, you know your your asset back into cash. But it would take probably a couple hours if you wanted to do it properly and you know get out at the best price as possible. So again, uh, you know this is what we're looking for. Does it need to be you know over ten million dollars? I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is whatever amount you're putting in, you need to be be sure that you can get it back out. Now on that. Let's go back a slide and just take a look. So on this one, let's say you're only wanting to play with 100 bucks, then that's a totally different thing. I know I'm using 50,000, but if you're gonna use $100, then yeah, if all you have $100 and you can you know, get, uh, let's say you make 200% on it, now you're looking to sell uh, for 400, I think my math's right there. Anyways, yeah, out of $93,000, I'm pretty confident you could probably sell $400 worth of stock. Now 50, totally different ball game. So that's what it boils down to. What amount are you gonna use? And these examples, I, I chose 50 just to prove a point. Here putting 50,000 makes no sense for something like this. But in the first example, it makes total sense. In this one, it could make sense. But again, your conversion, when you're trying to get back out, you know, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but it still would be possible because there is you know, $14.3 million that occurred in this one day. So even if that, you could spread this out maybe a couple of days and then you have you know $30 million to work with. So 50,000, yes, very possible, uh, but it's gonna be, you know, um, it's gonna take you a little bit longer. You're gonna have to use some finesse in it. Whereas you know with SPY, you're just, you could just hit sell and boom, you're gonna be out. You're not gonna affect the price at all. The market will easily absorb any shares that you put back into it. So some things to remember, just remember these points. First, for every buy, there's a sell. That may sound basic, but um, you know, a lot of times that gets overlooked. When you're converting cash into shares, remember you start with cash and that goes to shares, that is the buying. That's only half of the process of making money. And that is the easy part. Any penny stock company is gonna say, yeah, we'll sell you some shares. Come on, buy some shares. Everyone's allow everybody is more than happy to take cash from you and give you a piece of paper otherwise known as a share. That's never a problem in the world of penny stocks. However, when you want to convert those shares back into cash, otherwise known as selling, this is and this is obviously where you actually make money. This can be very, very difficult if you're not, uh, you know, taking into consideration the liquidity going in. So the two numbers you need to know, remember, are the number of shares traded and the lowest price per share of that range. And this just assumes that you don't have software that'll tell you straight up how much liquidity it has, how much dollar volume is a proper term. So write this down: dollar volume equals liquidity. Share volume does not matter. Write that again. Share volume does not matter. I don't care if a stock has done 500 million shares because if each one of those shares is trading for triple zero one, the dollar volume, the liquidity is not that impressive. Same thing, you could say, oh, this penny stock, you know, it, it did 100 million shares. Again, if those shares are only trading for triple zero one, that's not that much liquidity. So share volume, you know, if you haven't written it down, do it, circle it, highlight it, share volume, does not matter. Dollar volume equals liquidity equals everything. Because there's no point in making, there's no point in being the mark in the market if you can't convert your shares back into cash. That is what the stock market is all about. But with liquidity traps, it's possible for you to get a bunch to again, the penny stock people, they'll gladly take your cash and hand you a piece of paper. But they're gonna be a little bit more stingy. It's gonna be a little bit more hard in terms of finding people to buy those shares because there's not many share buybacks going on in penny stock land. I'll put it like that. So crucial concept. I know I'm kind of repeating myself and going over and over it again, but this is a crucial concept because really this is the ABCs of trading. If you wanna be able to make money, you you have to be able to sell. Not buy, because buying's always the easy part. You have to be able to convert those shares back into cash, which is selling, and if you're not careful in penny stock wilderness, uh, you will get bit and you're gonna get your legs leg or something worse caught in a trap. Another big question I get, and something else that is very important for uh, the world of penny stocks is, you know, what order type is for me? What, I mean, my broker offers me all these options. How come my broker doesn't offer this option for penny stocks? I mean, the, the questions are all out there, but in penny stocks, there are three order types that need to be considered and utilized. Uh, the first is a market order. 
The next is a limit order, and then the third is a stop loss, but needs to be a mental stop loss. So let's just first, let's talk about a market order. A market order, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna get into the theory, let's just, I wanna keep things grounded and hopefully easy to understand. A market order is basically you telling your market maker, remember the, the market makers, they work for us, it's telling your market maker, I want X amount of shares, and I don't care what price I get them at, and I need them quickly. So this is just saying the market maker is gonna go out there and grab shares. You don't care what price, you just want the shares. So they're gonna go out there and get them for you at all cost. In a very liquid stock, there is no harm in these orders. Uh, you know, going back to the SPY, when that one does, you know, just a boatload of liquidity, you can put a market order in and whatever price you see at that point in time, that's pretty much the price that you're gonna get. It might be off by a couple pennies, but boom, that's what price you're gonna get at it because it's so liquid. Now, if a stock is not liquid, do not use these orders. So in other words, on a majority of penny stocks, you don't wanna go in with a market order because you don't want the market maker, or you don't wanna be telling the market maker to say, get shares at any cost, because if it's not liquid, you could be, you know, the price might be showing you right now two and a half cents, but a market order, you could be paying a lot more than two and a half cents, because if they're gonna go out there, they're gonna buy all the shares that are available at two and a half cents. They're gonna buy all the shares that are available at two and a, or 0.026. They're gonna buy all the shares that are available at 0.027. And before you know it, your average share price is you know three cents when you originally just thought it would be somewhere around two and a half. Again, if it's super liquid, then all right, you, you, you'll be all right. But if it isn't, or if it's borderline, then you definitely don't wanna use a market order. There's very, very few instances in the world of penny stocks where I, I think a market order would make sense. Now the order that uh, you know penny stock traders need to embrace and just um, use, like I said, the majority of the time is gonna be the limit order. So the limit order is your way of telling the market maker, I want X amount of shares, but I'm only willing to pay Y price for them. And I'm willing to be patient for them. Like I said, 80% of the time, this is what you wanna use when you're trading with pennies. Uh, that's not like a research term, that's kinda of off the top of my head. Maybe it should be even higher than that, but point being, vast majority of the time, you wanna be using limit orders. The reason these are so important is because they ensure you are not overpaying for anything and they give you complete total control. Now, the, the, the one you know trade-off, uh, the world is filled with trade-offs, the trade-off uh, that you're giving in order to gain this control is there's no guarantee that you're ever gonna get those shares. But to me, the way I look at it and the way you should look at it is you, in the penny stock world, you wanna be in full control. So I'll take full control compared to you know being at the mercy of the market order, market order any day of the week. So that's the way I look at it. And with limit orders, you can put them above or below the current price. So uh, you know a quick little example, let's say the current price is 0.025 uh, and you're willing to pay up to three cents a share. All you would do is enter in a limit order for the shares you want at 0.03, and then the market makers will go and they'll buy all shares available for you up to three cents. Now, it's not guaranteed that you're gonna buy any shares at three cents. Maybe all the shares you want are available at 0.025, but maybe they have to buy some at 0.025, buy some at 0.026, and then buy a little bit more at 0.027, and then you're in. But you're telling them that you're willing to pay up to three cents. Now, this is just an example. I'm not saying you should always do that sort of increment. Um, so don't go and do that. But a limit order at least gives you control. Whereas a market order is saying, yeah, the price is 0.025, but I want, sh I, I, I just want, the, I want this amount of shares. And they, they, like I said, they might buy everything at 0.025, buy everything at 0.027, buy everything at 0.003, buy everything at 0.033, depending on how many shares you want. You just don't know. The market order is totally out of your control, and that's why you want to stick with these sorts of limit orders. And then the final order is the stop loss, and this is a mental uh, type of thing, so I'll explain more what I mean by that. But a stop loss is your way of saying, you know, I wanna sell X amount of shares if the tr price drops below Y price level, and I should have made this a different color, but stop loss, money management, this is what it's all about. People get in trouble because they let little small losses that they could have had turn into gigantic ones, and then their portfolio goes, see you later. So stop losses are huge. Now, we are gonna use mental ones for two reasons. First off, most brokers don't even allow you to use a stop loss order on penny stocks, and this is for very good reason. And why is this? Well, that's what we're gonna cover right here in step number, or point number two. A stop loss turns into a market order when a sell is hit. So if you say, going back to our example, you know we buy in at 0.025, and let's say you put a, your broker allows you to put in a, a, a stop loss, and you put in a stop loss at 0.023. What you are saying is, in this example, I wanna sell, all the shares uh, that I bought, if the price drops below 
0.0231. Because if it drops below 0.0231, it's at 0.023. That's where my order is. And then from there, it turns into a market order and you're saying just sell my shares at any cost. The problem with this is, goes back to liquidity. Because penny stocks, a lot of them are illiquid, you could be you could think that you're selling, you know, you're gonna sell all your shares at 0.023, but depending on what the market is like, your average, you know, share price sold may not be in, until 0.015, or it could be worse than that. Again, you're at the mercy of a market order, and when it comes time to selling, you know, you just don't want that. You want to be a mental one, meaning if you're planning to trade it, you want to be watching. And I should say, when you're planning to trade it, that means you have to plan out the trade. And if you don't plan out your trades, then uh, again, you're setting yourself up for disaster. But part of the plan means you need to know. Where, where my where the level is that you're going to get out at that's just basic money management um, and if you know like I said if you if you're not planning the trade then you're not doing a very basic principle so again mental means you're mentally making a note so telling yourself writing it down however you want to do it that if the price hits this level I am selling and getting out and I'm going to use you know a, a limit order say I'm willing to sell down to this point and getting out but you don't want to just put in the market order because who knows how low those shares are actually going to be sold so um, that, that's just, you know, that's why brokers don't offer them. And, you know, stop losses, yes, they do get tricky with penny stocks, but that that's a trade off of penny stocks themselves. You know, on the big board stocks, you're not going to make 10%, you know, every couple of days. Um, but the trade off there is, you know, a stop loss, everything's very liquid, so you're going to get out very fast. That, you know, the markets have, um, you know, the trade offs themselves, and that's the one trade off here. Uh, a stop loss in the world of penny stocks is certainly not a, a perfect system, but that goes back to the whole liquidity thing. So uh, just be very careful. And again, this is why I always want to say avoid the liquidity traps. If you're in a liquidity trap or in a stock that doesn't have much liquidity, and then you, you want to try to get out and sell, uh, you know, especially if, if even if it's just your mental stop loss, it can be a big pain in the butt if you're not monitoring that liquidity. So again, going back to that previous core concept, liquidity is a huge thing that you need to pay close, close attention to uh, because it can make these types of orders go much smoother. You know, these orders are totally fine and, you know, there's there's nothing to worry about as long as you're keeping yourself in liquid stocks. But if you're allowing yourself to drift into liquidity traps, then you're going to hate these orders and you're going to think that, uh, you know, a limit order is the dumbest thing ever or that, you know, you got screwed over. No, you didn't get screwed over. It's just you're in a liquidity trap and that's just how the market works. There's not much liquidity out there. The ability to convert into cash is just not, you know, what it would be on a big board stock. And I'm gonna wrap up uh, this video here. I'm gonna try to keep these next two right around 30 minutes. So we'll go into some more co core concepts in part number two. But again, I'm just gonna drive it home one more time. Liquidity traps, Keep pay attention to liquidity. That's uh, really one of the, the key things if you wanna have any success in the stock market. So uh, if anything, go calculate some liquidity, some share, uh, some share or some dollar volume on some stocks right now and really get a good grasp on that or uh, screw around with your scanner see if that uh, function is offered if it is you definitely want to get that turned on well I hope you enjoyed and if you did please do a couple things for me hit that like button and leave a comment below even if you just say thanks also go to claytrader.com forward slash team and if you want to join my private community that's got all sorts of added benefits you can learn more at that link then please join I'd love to have you it's very cost effective and like I said if you want to surround yourself with other quality like-minded people such as yourself then I hope you give it some consideration but again if you enjoy the video hit that like button and leave a comment down below